All right. Anybody here for the first time tonight? All right, we just have a little something to welcome you to Refuge. Thank you for coming. We always like to welcome our first-time guests, and we hope this isn't your first time and your last time. We want to see you more often, so that's awesome. Great, great to see you here. A couple quick announcements. Those of you that have been getting the food basket, the uh, food boxes, this was, as far as we know, the end of those was this Friday. Now, that doesn't mean next week I won't get a new opportunity, and that's why we always say get on Facebook so you can see. Uh, that's where we re usually promote that stuff first. So, you know, be watching because as new opportunities come, we basically say yes to just about everything. And uh, today we had 1,092 boxes that went out the door. It was wonderful. Uh, it was harder than having two semis because we had to tell people, sadly, we didn't have a, enough today. We got to kind of experience that a little bit. Um, and that's not an easy thing, but uh, people seem to be understanding. I know Pastor Will, he ran out and Calvary ran out because there's a lot of hungry people here in Old Brooklyn. And I hope that there's a lot of hungry people for the Word of God here in Old Brooklyn tonight because that's the main thing we want it to be about. Thanksgiving, I just want to let you make sure everybody knows we have a tradition here at Refuge. We've done it all three years we've been in this building. We have the Thanksgiving meal here. If you don't have a family or a place to go for Thanksgiving, you have here at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We will be serving Thanksgiving. I bring my family here and other families come alongside of us and join. Uh, so if you are going to be able to come to that meal, I ask that you kind of just let us know so we keep making sure we got enough turkey. How many know if you don't have enough turkey, you got a problem on your hands on Thanksgiving? That's, that's the big one, right? And, and then we have a good time gathering together and spending. And if you want to donate anything towards that, because we also make baskets and things like that to give to people, you know, Thanksgiving-style food, please bring that f oh, up. And then the last announcement for you is I'm leaning towards Friday, November 20th being our baptism night. So if you were thinking of baptism start making sure we've had our connection so we can make sure we got that figured out because I want to make sure if I, if I ended up with like 50% can't make it that night then it'll be different. Eventually you'll have a slide up here with an official but until then I'm leaning towards November 20th. It's a good spot I think in, in this preaching on Revelation that I can hit a pause for a week and we can celebrate. It looks like we can have anywhere from 8 to 12 baptisms. I'm not quite sure right now. All right, so that's a great time to proclaim what the Lord is doing. So if you are never been followed the Lord in baptism and you are already saved and you have never been able to give that testimony, we're here to talk. We want to share what that opportunity is. We, you're not going to uh, find that we will let you get in there and uh, if you're not saved. We're going to make sure you understand that you need the assurance of salvation first. All right, that's it in way of announcements right this moment. So I turn it over to... All of these guys over here. Hey, guys. We'd like you to stand up worship with us. Before we do, we always like to lift us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for another day and another week, another time to be vertical, upright, to have the blessings of to be able to see maybe again another sunrise in Cleveland if we don't need <laughs> Noah's Ark. Lord, I thank you that we come here to have our souls and our hearts and our spirits nourished. We might have had a week that you just couldn't wait to get it over with. We might have had a day that someone was standing on your very last nerve, but I pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us tonight with your presence. I pray that our voices will be lifted up as one, as a sweet sound that's pleasing to hear. I pray that the words that Pastor Don preaches touches our hearts and touches our souls so that we walk out a different person than when we walked in here tonight. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. And guys, we grade you on how loud you sing. So sing loud, because when you sing loud, we sound better, okay? You don't know what it's like when you're up here worshiping. And you guys are louder than us, and we're amplified. It makes the hair on our arms stand up. Okay, so worship with us tonight. Are you guys ready? All right. One, two, one, two, three. Not to us. 
but to your name be the glory not to us but to your name be the glory not to us but to your name be the glory comes before me leave the world behind no turning back raise the banner high it's not for us it's all for you let the heaven shake and split the sky let the people clap their hands and cry it's not for us it's all for you not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Our hearts unfold before your throne, the only place for those who know it's not for us, it's all for you. Send your holy fire on this offering. Let our worship burn for the world to see. It's not for us, it's all for you. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. The earth is shaking, the mountains shouting, it's all for you. The waves are crashing, the sun is raging, it's all for you. The universe is spinning and singing, it's all for you. The children dancing, 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 it's all for you. It's all for not to us, to your name be the glory. Not to us, to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name. Be the glory, not to us. Who am I that the highest king? would welcome me I was lost but he brought me and oh his love for me oh his love for me oh the sun sets free oh it's free and deep I'm a child ransomed me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh he's free and deep I'm a child
the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. And you are the path of waters. Wherever you would call me, take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the prayer. seated. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter is where we're going to be at today. But we're going to start with a little bit of agriculture. Who knows what it is? Cucumber. Cucumber, Where do they grow? On the ground. Yes, somebody got it right. It kind of looks like a vine on the ground. But how does it start out? It's a seed, a very, very small seed. How about this thing? Anybody know what it is? It's a pear. How does it grow? Tree. So how does it start out? Okay, but on a tree, give me a little more. You're giving me the Jesus answer. It looks like a little blossom, doesn't it? Like a flower. Yeah, I heard it over there. So it looks a lot different than how it originally started, right? For our friends in Florida, orange, where do they grow? And how do those start out? We don't know. Perfect. Apple. Tree with a flower, yeah. So why am I showing you a whole bunch of different looking produce? Because what we're going to be talking about today is a harvest. And it might look one way for a long period of time. But there's going to come a day where we're going to figure out there's only two ways that that harvest can occur. Some are going to get harvest to everlasting life, and others are going to get harvest to eternal damnation. This is one of the reasons we preach through a book of the Bible. This is one of those parts that if you want it to go topical, you don't really want to talk about eternal damnation, do you? No, it doesn't really bring a lot of reviews. But it's important to do because if we don't share the whole Bible, if we don't teach the truths of the Bible, you might be dismayed. You might somehow think just coming in this building and serving or coming in this building and saying a certain prayer or doing certain things can get you to heaven because nothing you do can get you to heaven. Nothing I do can get you to heaven. It's everything about what he did. Notice in that last song, you call me out upon the waves. It wasn't like, look at me, I'm a wave runner. No, it was, I'm afraid to go out there and you call me. And that's what we're going to talk about as we look at chapter 14 tonight, is what God does. So are you ready? Let's start at verse 1 here. 
Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits of God to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without, f- they are without fault before the throne of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, almighty God, saving God, righteous God, we humbly come today to hear from you. I pray that your word goes forth and I pray that it speaks to each and every heart here. I pray for hearts to be softened to hear. I pray for soil to be ready to be cultivated. And I pray for that one that is tired is beat down, that is exhausted of doing it their way, that they will hear that their way is not the way, but your way is. Gracious God, I pray for those that have been walking with you for a while to take their eyes and gaze back at you, to like some of this produce that we've seen, that sometimes we lose sight of how long it takes to be cultivated, and maybe the results in their families aren't what they want. Maybe the results in their own spiritual walk are not what they desire, but let them look back to you. And let them see that you have a perfect plan. And let us accept your will in our lives. And let us proclaim your name to the nations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've been looking at Revelation, we're we're intentionally presenting all four views. And how many know that's not always easy to do? Because sometimes you can get stuck on that view you've learned the most, or you've read the most in commentaries, or you yourself have grown in a church that is presented one way. But intentionally, I want you to think, because how many know that my goal is not to convince you to follow me in interpreting, but for you to get into your scripture. You to read, and you to wrestle, and you to ask questions in the Bible. Because if you think for a moment that you can just read this book once and say, it all makes 100% sense, then you need to be coming up here and teaching because me and Jeff want to hear. Because when I read certain things in here, I have to hit the pause button. You ever have to hit the pause button going, what is going on? We looked at it today. We're talking this 144,000 again. It's like, wait a minute. Didn't we talk about that before? Yeah, we talked about this in Revelation chapter 7. Verse 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So is this necessarily the same? It could be. We have to look at what the views deal with this. The historists are saying no. Remember when we talked about the 144,000 before, they said that was not a number like we're sitting here and counting to 144,000, but it represented a large number. It represented a complete number because what is the number seven? Completeness. And we start doing the math out. That's what they were talking about. So some say that it could represent that. Others would say that it was that same 144,000, that if you look at the beginning, they didn't really tell you much about them, but now they're kind of telling you things more about these 144,000. They they tell you something that, again, might cause you to hit the pause button because they're sitting there and saying that these were one that had never been by women. So is God somehow saying that marriage is now not a good thing? And, And the answer to that is no. The answer to that is no, and this is why when we look at our scripture, we wrestle at times, because what he could be saying here, what he would be saying here, is this is the morally pure people. These were people that had set themselves apart for the Lord. That doesn't necessarily mean they were married or they weren't married. They were bringing an illustration of spiritually not committing adultery. If we look through scripture, we'll see many places where they talk about spiritual adultery, because when we do anything that we are craving after that replaces God... We're committing adultery in his eyes, aren't we not? We've made it an idol. Guys, we can do this with football on Sundays, can't we? You ever been that guy that you don't 
but get bothered. You get on your remote, you watch your game, and you don't want nothing to disturb you. God doesn't want that, does he? <laughs> not all the time, does he? Now, does that mean football is the Antichrist? No, not at all. But it does mean that if we have things that can replace the love of God, things that take us out of following and worshiping God, we need to be very careful with them. We need to recognize that they can potentially be. Our future as friends look at this as this is not in chronological order anymore. This is a section that's kind of an interlude that's actually going ahead to talk about some things that haven't happened yet. It's kind of like the table of contents of what's going to go on showing you from this period on, because you're going to encounter some things in here, like for instance, this 144,000 they're saying is with God in heaven, that this is after some things have already occurred. But they're kind of, he's talking about it here. And I don't know how many of you have noticed this in the scripture. Our Bible is not only supposed to be read from Genesis to Revelation, is it? You can get caught. Anybody ever try to do that? Go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and you're going, whoa, this is getting dry. You ever been there? Start reading the numbers, you start looking at the census or the measurements of the temple, some of these things, and you're like, what does that mean for me? And a lot of times it doesn't mean a thing right this moment, does it? But it meant something because God put it there, amen? And as we study and as we read, God walks us through different periods of time where sometimes the light bulb goes on. Ever have the light bulb go on and you're like, this used to be dry here. And now it's making sense. I know for me, sometimes when we're going through numbers and I read certain names and then I can look at certain tribes and see what certain people did, it kind of gives me that assurance of God's in every little detail. If he's in their details, he's in our details. And it's important. The preterists, again, always, always, always are going to come up with the same thing. They're going to talk about this representing the Jews that escaped Jerusalem prior to 70 AD. It's always around 70 AD. The idealists, I like how they approach this. They're saying that these people that appear to be that purity, this is not necessarily about being sinless, but this is about nothing to hide. When's the last time you wrestled with your faith enough saying, hey, I know I'm a sinner. That's an easy one. But I'm quitting up playing at hide and go seek, making it look like I got it all together. You ever been there? You walk into church, you're having a garbage life, you've gotten bad news, you yourself are in a bad mood, and somebody asks you how you're doing. I'm fine. Now here, let me let you in on a little inside joke. You're not, and we know you're a liar. Because we are too. Because the Christian walk is not always easygoing times, is it? Matter of fact, many people I talk to will share the same thing that I experienced. The more you follow Christ, the harder this life gets sometimes. Because you encounter things and you recognize what it is now and you desperately want to help somebody, but they're not open to the gospel. They're not open to the things of Christ. We said today, it was easier when we had two semi-trucks than when we had one. Why? We had plenty. And when we had plenty, it was easy when somebody come up, can I have four? Yeah, can I have ten? Yeah, can I have two? Can I have this? Today it was you can have one or two. We watch people fight on Natchez Road, literally arguing that I got to this spot before I, you got to this spot. We watch people complain because they got four last week and they only got two this week. It shows me the sinfulness of humanity, that when we got what we want, we're totally content. But you take away one thing that we feel is entitled to us, and we'll bring out our true colors. Well, as we look here, these people that are being shown here, that are going into heaven, that are singing a song that nobody else can sing, appear that they are following the Lord completely. So it's time to hit that pause button and look in ourselves. Where are you at with your kids? Where are you at with your neighbors? Where are you at with your family? Would they say you're a follower of Christ or you go to church? Because there's a big difference, isn't there? 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Guys, we need to recognize sin is in our lives. 
That's not an excuse to keep it there, is it? It's an excuse to do what? Eradicate it. Change it. Work through it. Be motivated to do something about it. And a lot of times, that takes getting with somebody else, doesn't it? Christianity, you can't show me anywhere in the Bible where it calls us into isolation for long periods of time. Jesus would go out, and Jesus would be alone as he would pray, but he would always come back. Even when they would come and find him, he would never be like, I'm in my holy prayer time, leave me alone. You don't see that. You see him embracing people because this life is meant to be working together. We struggle together. We win together. We do things together for the sake of who? Almighty God. When we pass out 1,900 1, boxes of food, it is nothing that we have done. It is everything that he has done because take a look around and we should not be handling that big of boxes compared to bigger churches in the world, should we? But God is opening up doors because he gives us the hands. He gives us the strength. He gives us the ability and we need to praise and recognize him for that. The only reason we have things is because God himself is giving them to us. So he wants that relationship. If you're struggling with something in sin, you need to confess it. Not like thinking the way that you might have come in some denominations where there's a little box in the back and you got a curtain and you come and you talk to the box and all of a sudden the guy has the great wisdom of exactly what you need to do. That's not what we're talking about. But there's sometimes where confession does need to be to another human being. Confession sometimes to be, will you help walk with me through this? And that brings in what? Accountability. And we don't like that word, do we? If you notice the election... Boy, they don't want to talk about accountability. If you hear the Democrat side, it's like, show me the tax reason. I want accountability. If you talk on the other side, show me the transcripts on Hunter. What do you want? I want accountability. We love to hide from accountability. But according to this book, we cannot hide. He sees everything. He knows everything. Do we embrace the part of the Christian walk, which is continuing deal with sin, or do we try to push our sins under the rug? That is what we have to wrestle with as we're looking at this chapter. Because when we see that they're able to sing a song, when we see that God is exalting them, it's because of what he's done. We know that they're not perfect because they said they were of the earth. Nobody that has ever lived on this earth but Jesus Christ himself was perfect. Anyone that you think is a better Christian than you is just as messed up as you are. Have you ever noticed who we compare ourselves to? Because we look at people through what they show us. But then, have you ever seen when something kind of comes off to the side and you see what they really are and how short you feel about them? Yeah, because we sh we, we've put the mark on the wrong thing. If you want to compare yourself, there's only one person to compare yourself to. His name's Jesus Christ. He was perfect. See how you measure up with that. And what should happen is when you measure yourself next to Jesus, you should get really good at wearing your knees out. On your knees and asking for forgiveness and praising him and asking him for glory. We had a wonderful time here Sunday night as people proclaimed the majesty of Jesus Christ, didn't they? People got serious and dealt with some sinful issues here. And that needs to happen in churches all the time. It doesn't have to be an invitation to come forward. It might be, Lord, knocking you flat in your pew. And you need to just get right with the Lord. You don't need to say, wait, i got to wait to some special invitation at the end. No, you get right with the Lord right when he's talking to you. You get right with the Lord if you don't know him right this minute because you don't know if you're getting another breath. We're going to see as this chapter and as this book ramps up, it gets worse and it gets worse. Not to scare us if we're Christians, but yeah, to warn the world. Because if we're Christians, then we need to have assurance, don't we? Full confidence that no matter what happens, if the coronavirus takes me out, I know where I'm going. Do you? Because if you don't, let's talk. That's how serious it is. Because planes could hit. Bullets can fly. People get sick. Cancer happens. Strokes happen. All of that is still going on right now. Yeah, Mary. Yes, yes. We are gonna, you know, we're going to stop right now. Pastor Ken, a lot of you know Pastor Ken. He is doing very poorly right now. Uh, last I heard on a Facebook post, he went to, um, 
um, Metro, and I don't know if he'll ever come back home. I'm not sure. That's what the way the post read. Okay, so then we have heard a little better on there because the post looked really, really great, and Robin's battling cancer too. So, Father, we do. We lift up Kevin, Pastor Ken, rather, and we lift up Robin right now, and I pray first and foremost they know you as Lord and Savior. And, Lord, if they don't, then I pray that today's the day you will save them, not make them churchy people, make them save people. And, Lord, I pray for healing. I pray for them to sense your touch. I pray for those that know them to rally around them and love them and serve them well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for bringing that up. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Do you see what's going on? They're still offering the gospel. The everlasting gospel. The gospel doesn't cease being offered until the curtain is drawn of this time. Where are you at with that? Think in your mind, is there's that person that you know that you're close to that if they died today, will spend it separated from Almighty God. And if you know that person, then start praying and asking God, how do you want me to communicate? What do you want me to share? What do you want me to invite to? Where do you want me to go? Because yes, their blood is on your hands. If you know the truth and you're not willing to share, you're willing to say, I don't care if you go to hell. And I know you don't want to do it that way, but that's what we do because we think we might offend them. We might offend them to hell number two, right? No, there's only one. There's only one hell. There's only one heaven. And he's talking about this. This angel is preaching loudly, it says. We need to proclaim the gospel. Notice what's so different in this verse and in this chapter from what we read last chapter. What was going on with the beast? The beast was saying, if you don't love me, if you don't serve me, I will kill you. God is saying, there's still time, repent. There's still time, come to me. He is a perfect gentleman calling you to salvation, but not beating you into submission like the world does, huh? You know the way to tell that the world's against you? Just mention Jesus and see what happens. Just have a conversation. Somebody actually challenged me with this, and i got to figure out how to do it, because how many of you, when, when your cell phone rings, if you don't know the name, if you don't have a contact, you can let that thing go to voicemail. Anybody else do that? Yeah, because we're getting bombarded with 50 calls. I mean, I, I get told to vote like 35 times from both parties, and I think there's a third one out there trying to call me now. It gets annoying after a while. And then I made the mistake about a month and a half ago of looking for medical insurance, and I got about 3,000 people wanting to sell me practices. But you know what this person shared with me? Well, they called you. Why don't you ask them if they know Jesus? Just ask them a simple question. I'm like, man, I never thought of that. I'm going to try that on a couple so I'm going to throw that out. I'm throwing it on Facebook. You get somebody you don't know, just ask them. Hey, do you know Jesus Christ? And maybe, just maybe, they'll get into a conversation with you. But yeah, we need to recognize that our enemy is going to say submit or die, where what our Almighty God is saying is there's still time to repent. But there's a day coming. There's a day coming where that, there won't be no more time. That day's not there right now. We don't know how long. That's the biggest thing we want to remember as we study this book of Revelation is it's not so much about getting your eschatology right is it's about getting your soul right. Because you need to have comfort if you're a Christian which gives you assurance to keep enduring and if you're lost, you need to come to the cross. That's what they're talking about in this book. Over and over and over again, in different illustrations, in different views, letting you know there's still time if you don't know, but warning you that there's coming a day where there won't be any more time. Verse 8, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And this is, like I said before, I argued that it's talking about something we're going to deal with as we go further in the book. But Babylon can represent many different things, can it? There was a city called Babylon. There was a city that 
had a guy named Nebuchadnezzar running it. It was an evil kingdom, wasn't it? It was a powerful kingdom, but the Medes and the Persians took that over. And there came a day where that Babylon fall. Some commentators will argue that Babylon itself will come right back up on the river Euphrates and will be a major city. Others will say that Babylon is Rome. It was the power that it's talking about. But what it's talking about is fallen. So it's letting us know that anything you think has it all together or is in charge or has control besides God himself is going to fall one day. You know, I don't know how many of you like Charles Spurgeon, but I found a great podcast where I'm actually listening to his sermons. And I actually got a guy that's not saying them with a British accent, so I really can dive deep into Spurgeon. But Charles Spurgeon was called the pastor's pre- the prince of preachers. Charles Spurgeon just talked very plainly. And he talked about many times in his sermons going, sometimes when we come up here, we get it too deep. Because the gospel is supposed to be clear. The gospel is something that no matter where you are, you can recognize, are you trusting Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is? If not, why? That's what it's talking about. And that is what Babylon is represented forever. It's all those things we chase after instead. Maybe you're sitting here, maybe you're sitting on Facebook and you're like, but, you know, I, I got my 401k in line, my, my, my finances are good, everything's going good, my health is good, I'll worry about religion later. Do you know how quick those things can change, guys? And the problem is, if we're not prepared, we're not going to know how to handle it. Getting saved is not the best idea right when the storm hits all the time. Now, I, we can bring testimonies up, and some will share that that has happened. But it's much better to look backwards at your life and say, I've tried that. It didn't work. I've tried that. You can't try Jesus Christ. Has anyone figured that out? You have to surrender to Jesus Christ because he's speaking, and he's telling you, I have the way. That way is to fully put your faith, trust in me and me alone. To admit, as we talked about in First John, that you have committed sin. Well, and sin simply is when you look at this Bible and it says you should have done this and you're going, I never did that. Or it says you should do this and you're like, I haven't done that. It's admitting that God said what is right and what is wrong and you don't keep it right. But he did. Do you believe it? He never sinned. It was per- he lived perfect. He is the only one that could take the death that we deserve. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. That's the message we need to be sharing with our loved ones. Not trying to do what I see the church doing all the time, and that's take lost people and somehow give them a theological degree before they ever get saved. How many times I see on Facebook and many other places where we will fight spiritual arguments with people that we don't even know if they know the Lord. Shame on the church. We need to build relationship based on the gospel and then start discipling people so they have a fighting chance in Christianity. And we wonder why all these other religions exist in this world. Because we are the only religion, we are the only faith out there that shoots our wounded. We step on them, we break their neck, we condemn them, we cast them out of the church over the most trivial things sometimes, or we do the opposite, and we just ignore sin. We just let it go. We put it underneath the rug. Neither one of those are acceptable. Persecuting the city of true Christianity is overthrown is what we see in this Babylon. The persecution will always be there. You ever try to take your Bibles to school anymore? You know, technically, legally, they can't tell you you can't. But why don't you just walk around and start passing them out in the hallway and see what happens? Why don't you start having some discussions about Jesus with people in certain public areas and see what happens? You will see what the world will do with Jesus Christ. We've watched it in AA. Do you know when AA first started, it was based on the book of James? It was extremely biblical. Do you know there's AA chapters that I've had people give testimony that they go to and they say, I'm giving credit to my higher power is Jesus. And they go, he's not welcome here. Because Jesus is narrow. They would rather that this water bottle be your higher power or the chair you sit in. 
It's one of the reasons we have Celebrate Recovery as opposed to AA and NA, because in Celebrate Recovery, what they state is, I am a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. If you are, and I struggle with, because how many know you are not an alcoholic for the rest of your life? It's a sin. Just like homosexuality is a sin, just like pornography is a sin, just like lying is a sin, just like sexual immorality, idolatry, lying, cheating, overeating. Those are all great examples of sin, but we don't have to be defined by them. We can surrender those things and have victory. Verse 9, a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, night or day, who worships the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saint. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works Follow them. Pretty long section there that we're looking at, but in a very, very important section. First and foremost is you've seen a group of people that were choosing something. They were choosing to take the mark of the beast. They were choosing to follow. Nobody in this world has an argument to say, the devil made me do it 100%. It's a choice. Sin is something you're born with, isn't it? We're all got a sinful nature. How many have ever watched a baby and you feed that baby, you put a diaper on that baby, you put that baby down, and what does that baby do if it doesn't feel like being put down? Screams its head off because it's the most selfish thing that's out there, isn't it? You know what selfish is? Sin. Because we want to make ourselves happy. We want to please ourselves. We want it all about us. So when, yes, when these marks were coming, we talked about that. Could it be that you might not be able to buy things? Yeah. But does that give you the excuse to say, well, God will understand. That's one of the lies we like to say in this world. God understands our sin. He does not understand our sin. He judges, punishes our sin. We have a choice, and we have to recognize that. And I think the reason we don't is because of the second point I want to bring up here, and that is people do not take hell seriously. They really and truly don't believe there's a hell. Have you ever seen some of the slogans we put? You know, the devil doesn't want me. Hell's afraid I'll take over. I'm going to go hang out with my boys in hell. Did you see what the scripture just said about hell? He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. That sure don't sound like a hangout. But we don't buy into it. We don't believe it. Just like when Sodom and Gomorrah was given as an example. They didn't believe it. Just like when Abraham, he argued with God directly. If I can find this many righteous, will you save it? Will you do this? And God waited and waited. But then judgment came. Just like as they were being rescued, his wife had to turn and look back one more time. It was turned into a pillar of salt. Because we don't take it seriously. Because if we took hell seriously, you can bet we'd be sharing more gospel, wouldn't we? Because you know that friend of yours that you used to go shoot pool with that's going to hell? How's that making you feel? I hope it's challenging you to do something about it strike up a conversation share your heart with them of why you're doing this we are in the midst of a global pandemic and the churches in most cases are empty because we're not giving the hope of the gospel this is actually a wake-up call guys that god is not going to be mocked sin is part of this pandemic isn't it because with sin came sickness into the world disease came in because of the fall so this should not surprise us we need to warn people because how many know that if you're going to die from the coronavirus you're going to die from the coronavirus 
Just like if you're going to get T-bone going out of Park Heights like Jeff almost did the one day. But it wasn't his day, praise the Lord. But we don't know. We need to warn. We need to love people. We don't need to, ar- notice I'm not saying you need to argue with people. You ever tried to argue somebody into salvation? It doesn't work. Tell them where you stand. Tell them why you desperately want them to consider the gospel. Give them the Bible. Ask them to read it. There's a methodology that's called share Jesus without fear. I know Tim knows about it. Anybody else ever seen the share Jesus without fear? But basically, you you have the Bible, and you hand it to them, and you have the verses, Mark. So so one of them is Romans 3.23, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You hand that to somebody that you're talking to, and you say, read that for me. And the hardest part with share Jesus without fear is the part we don't like in it. You have to shut up and listen to them. You can't have theology at that moment. You have to stop and listen to where they are. And how many know, no, I want to win. When you hear your theology being violated, you somehow want to correct that. Leave the theology out of it. Let them tell you what they believe. Let them tell you where they are. I was sharing once with a a co-worker, and we got to the part where it says, you know, the way is narrow. You've seen that part in the Bible before? He goes, this is why I don't believe the Bible. He says, what do you mean? He goes, well, what about those people in over in, in Australia that have never heard it? And we had to stop the conversation right there. Because I had to show him. It took time where I was able to bring other things around this guy to show him that, hey, there's missionaries that are trying to go. There's ways that are trying to be going. But you have heard the truth. I'm worried about you right now. And he hadn't responded. That's part of sharing. Sharing does not mean that we're going to have a contest and we're going to call up and say, okay, Tim, how many guys did you save this week? Jeff, oh, you're, down, you're behind by two. Come on, let's get to work. But that's what we've made Christianity be sometimes. It's one-on-one dialogue. It's conversations. It's preaching. It's teaching. And it's response on them. We need to drive for the decision. We need to give them the opportunity to respond to the gospel. But if only one responds or none today and 25 next week, it's the same in God's eyes. Celebration. Because we need to recognize that we did nothing. The scripture did everything. It's as the verses come alive off the paper, convicting that heart, taking that heart of stone and making it soft and pliable. Can you do that? No, we can't. Only the word. But when it starts to do it, we go the other way. We look at somebody and we try to figure them out. Instead, we got to let God figure them out. Because there's nobody bad enough that God can't save. There's nobody gone too far or done too much. I love when people come to get food and they'll be like, well, I don't want to go into church because, you know, the place will fall in on me if I come in. Anybody ever seen a church fall in on somebody because they come in that was that bad of a sinner? No. No. Oh, I, I just wants to be kind of neat. Wow, there he is. You were right. I didn't, I didn't really think about it. But the other part we miss in here, and you, and you see it in here, is he's telling you that the Christian walk is a marathon. How do we know somebody's a follower of Christ? By how they endure, how long they stay in the faith. Because how many know that it's pretty easy to come to an altar and just, you know, say a prayer and, you know. We'll, we can do an emotional song, and, and you'll respond to the song. That's not what it's following Christ is all about. Look at what it says in Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever deserve, desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? There's a dying that goes on in coming to Jesus. Just like these these things had to do. That seed, does this look like a seed anymore? No, the seed had to die. The seed had to go into the ground. The seed had to sprout and do things that nobody could see. Larissa just went through it as she was gardening. It didn't look like it for a while. All of a sudden, poof! got all this stuff i mean we, we had so much stuff coming here this year as it was growing and she was able to bless the church and give that out to the community but there was a long period nothing seemed to be going on 
And we have that in our Christian walk sometimes. You're reading your Bible, and it doesn't seem like you're having any victory. You're praying, and you don't get the answers you're wanting. God is germinating things in your life. God is saying, do you really trust me? Do you trust me in the good days and in the bad days? Do you trust me when the answer is yes, and do you trust me when the answer is no? Because he knows exactly what we need. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-17, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, and this was written, by the way, when he was in prison, which is but for a moment, is working us a far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. It's one of those things we struggle with. We want the here and now. God wants eternity with us. So when we're in the midst of a storm and we're suffering, to God that's like, this is a, compared to this. Pastor Mark used to do something going, it's a dot versus a line. I remember that at the Gospel House very clearly. That dot is all that we get in this lifetime. But the eternity goes on and on and on in a string. So when we're in the midst of the storm, if we can just hold on just a little bit longer, there is relief. Some of us, that relief is going to be when he calls us home. I've met some people that are suffering so bad, and sometimes you wonder, why are they still suffering? Because God has a perfect plan. And when they are taken home, we actually can see mercy maybe at that moment as he takes them out of the pain that they're in. But we never realize sometimes the effect of them just being here, what it did for somebody else. There's some people that I know that are in nursing homes that never can get out of bed that are prayer warriors, that are probably praying for some of us in this very room some days. And we don't see it, we don't hear it, but God has a perfect plan. And there's some people that I think we go through and we watch them suffer so we learn how to suffer ourselves. I didn't exactly sign up for Eddie to get cancer when he was four years old. It wasn't on my list of things I want is to have a child that had cancer. It wasn't exactly on my list to have a wife that struggles with fibromyalgia. That there's some days she can barely get out of bed. But I can tell you that as we walk through that trusting Christ, we've seen God show up in miraculous ways, in good days and in bad days. There's some of you in this room that have helped my wife with a text message on her worst days. There's some that she might have sent out to take her mind off her own pain as she's ministering to your pain. That is what it means to walk no matter what. Verse 14, I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now this is one of those places where they differ immensely in the commentaries. The idealists see that this reaping here is the actual rapture of the church. When this reaping is going on, that's when there's a calling out of the church. The futurists, some of them will argue this is the gathering of the elect, but there's others that will argue that this reaping here is actually lost people being condemned. Because as they're reaping, it says, of the earth. Are we of the earth or are we of the heaven? We have our citizenship in heaven. So what they're talking about is there's going to be people in the end age that appear they're not at the battle, that appear that everything's okay and they're going to be reaped also. This is kind of that sheep and goat thing going on here potentially. Because have you ever met that person that you think has it all together that you know doesn't follow Jesus, but it sure looks in this world like they got everything they want and need. Don't lose, don't, don't get focused on the here and now. Pray for them. Pray for your enemies. If you're sitting here and you think that President Trump's going to be the greatest person, I challenge you, be praying for Joe Biden. And maybe if you're in the Joe Biden camp, are you praying for Donald Trump? Because we're never going to see people growing back together until we recognize that we need to unify over the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why we can't legislate morality. We've tried it for centuries. It doesn't work. 
It's an individual thing that we have to put our own faith and our own trust in Christ and Christ alone. But this reaping that's going on, what they're showing you, though, is you can fake it all you want to your friends. God knows the truth. So quit playing church. I'd rather you don't come to church. I'd rather you argue with the church. I'd rather you say that you don't believe in the church than act like you're part of the church, but be on your way to hell right now. He talks about it, remember, in the lukewarm. These are the ones that think it's all right. I'm good. Are you? Because I'm not good. I'm not good at all. I'm despicably evil in my own flesh. But only by the grace of God am I saved. If you leave me to my mind, I can address people with my mind. If you leave me to my own mind, I can figure out a way to take advantage of something to make it work for my situation. But if I surrender to Christ, I can recognize and cast those thoughts out. Trusting in him. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. If you wanted to do the math on this, that would be about a four foot deep waterway of blood for 200 miles, basically covering the whole length of Israel. And some people go, well, what is that? Well, it's, it's, again, it's this reaping that's going on through the wrath of God. A lot of the commentators will argue that this is at the end when Armageddon was going on and the battle was going on. This is going to be the bloodiest battle that has ever been fought in the history of the world. But we already know who wins. Jesus wins. We have to take focus on them. This is those that survived the world and took the mark. They're being harvested into judgment. Judgment is real. We can't get away from it. We can't ignore it. This is where prosperity gospels do not want to go, do they? No, they want to tell you everything's going to get fine. No, there is a heaven to gain, but there's a hell to shun, guys. There is a decision that has to be made. And Christ is the one making, but you've got to respond when he's calling you. The time is now. Matthew 13, 24 through 31. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. This is our warning. In the midst of a church, in the midst of religion, we have wheat and tares. Probably have some tares in this room. I can't see it. You can't see it, but you know it if it's you. What's a tear? A tear is something of the world still, not surrendered to the gospel. There's believers that know they're on their way to heaven right now. They know that Jesus is the only way, and they're willing to die for it. Then there's others. They don't want to deal with this yet. What is this telling us? It's telling us at the end of the age, you can't fool God. He's also saying, we don't need to be calling everybody out. Our job as a church is not to be the sin inspector police. And some churches I know have went through that. Where if you're afraid, what if they found out that I might have accidentally swore today? That's not what they're talking about when it's walking and growing in Christ. What it is, is when, when our brothers or sisters are stumbling, we walk with them, we help them. If there's an open sin and they're not willing to repent, we work through that as a church. But the purpose of working through sin is getting them to recognize one thing. Are they in the body of Christ or not? When anybody's ever, you've heard the word excommunicated? Anyone ever heard that word? Yes. How many think that that is to punish? 
It's for the purpose of reconciliation. We put them out in hopes of them coming back. We always want them to come back. We extend the grace. We know that they're showing that there's a difference in us right now, and we have to put them out because they're not of us even though they're acting like they're of us. But our purpose is to keep witnessing and keep sharing because how many know, if not, then we don't deserve to be in heaven because we don't deserve it at all, do we? Our sin is still there. But when it's open and it's something that we're wrestling with, we have to. This harvest of the world that he's talking about is when judgment is beginning, when sin will be paid for. So the question I have for you is we're closing is either you're going to serve the world and enjoy it for a short time, or you're going to serve the Lord and, if need be, endure persecution, but have the opportunity to rejoice for all of eternity. Guys, we have to wrestle with this. We have to know where we are. If you're not a follower, today might be the day of your salvation. And if you don't know how to do that, just call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. But you have to believe. You have to believe that this book is true. You have to believe that everything that it said that Jesus was going to do and did was true. And that the only way to get to heaven is accepting the gift that he offers you. And if you do that, you have to be willing to repent, which means what? Stop what you're doing and start turning towards this book. And he will give you the things you need to repent of. We're not going to give you the following six things you've got to clean up by next week, Tuesday, or somehow you've got to go back and get saved again. That's not how that works. But the word will come alive. The word will speak to you. The word will drive you to your knees. We saw that Sunday night as people confess sin. We didn't manufacture that. People were open and they were responding to the spirit. And that is what the invitation is, is to respond to what God has already done. Maybe you're on Facebook, and maybe you've never trusted the Lord. Then you've got to be bold, too. You've got to be willing to do one thing with the Christian walk, and that is to share that you're following Jesus. If you're in this room, then tell somebody. You don't have to just tell me. You don't have to just tell Tim. You don't have to tell Jeff. But you've got to tell somebody. Don't be embarrassed, because the Bible warns us, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father. If you're on Facebook, one way you can do that, just type it, in our, type it in on the Facebook feed. I'm trusting Jesus for the first time. The reason for that is we want to plug you in for discipleship. We want to help you grow. We want to walk with you. We want to meet you right where you are. We do not somehow think that there is, you know, like this trajectory and everybody's got to stay on the same exact path. What we want to do is get you in your scripture and watch what the Lord does with you as he transforms you from the inside out. And then we want to plug you in because the Christian work comes as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Everyone that's sitting here, everyone that's on Facebook needs to understand that if you're not serving in a church of some capacity or another, you are in sin because he calls us to serve. And there's many different ways to serve. So don't think of it as just waiting tables. Again, you have to share with us so we can plug you in. But there's opportunity. So as we pray, I just want you, I want you to wrestle with this. Really want you to wrestle and say, if today was your last breath, do you know where you're going? Will you pray with me? Father, I just, I thank you for your word because your word is so powerful. Your word is so convicting. Your word shows the hypocrisy of mankind when we somehow try to build rules and, and regulations and ways to do things that your word just dashes them to pieces and reveals how foolish it really is. Your word is simple, but your word is profound. Your word is what we need to respond to. And, and the first part of our response for the first time for some is am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Because if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then a lot of what this book talks about makes no sense to you, and it never will. Because you don't have a Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit indwells you and will speak to you and will comfort you and will teach you. That doesn't happen with a dead person. And we're all spiritually dead until you come into their life. 
So, Father, I pray that if you're drawing somebody, they will respond to your gospel. They will tell somebody, I am trusting Jesus for the first time today. Will you pray with me? And they will not be ashamed of your gospel. And, Lord, if, if they're truly trusting you, they'll be willing to let the world know. Lord, and then I pray for those that have maybe trusted you but have never moved from that point, that they will repent and say, I need to be involved in the work of the gospel. There's so many ways. There's financial ways. There's prayer ways. There's serving ways. There's going out and doing things. There's repairing. There's sharing. There's teaching. There's music. There's tech. There's computers. The list goes on. But Lord, let us not forget that the number one thing is to share the word. There's evangelism. And Lord, you might be calling your church out more boldly. I know you are. So, Father, I pray that we will have the courage to witness. We will rely on you to provide us the words. We will not worry what our friends will think. We will worry what our Father will think if we're silent. Lord, and I pray for those that, that are frustrated, that have almost got to the point of giving up, almost thought that what they're doing isn't good enough. Will you remind them that it's about you? Remind them that you always keep a remnant. Remind them that you have a perfect plan. And it's a privilege to be used by you. It's a privilege to be able to do Christian service. So Father, there's a lot of people out there that don't know you. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I pray you send more workers out into the harvest tonight. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Understand your ways. Oh, but I will give you my song. I'll give you all of my praise. You hold on to all my pain. With it. The sight of your face is all that I need, and I say to you, it's gonna be worth it, it's gonna be worth it, it's gonna be worth it all, I believe it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna, gonna be, be worth, worth it. it. It's gonna, gonna be worth it all. I don't understand no, your way. Oh, oh, but I, I will, will give you my song. I'll give, give you all of my praise. praise. You hold on to, to all my praise. With it, you are pulling me closer, pulling me into your ways. Now, around every corner and up every mountain, I'm not looking for crowns or the water from fountains. I'm desperate and seeking. Believing that the sight of your face is all that I need, 
can I say to you? It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it all. I believe this. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it all. I believe this. You're gonna be worth it. You're gonna be worth it. You're gonna be worth it all. I believe this. You're gonna be worth it. You're gonna be worth it. You're gonna be. Worth it. You're gonna be worth it. 